Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Island Uplift's History Class. It is so good to have you. Now in today's class, we will be taking a look at the Sugar Revolution. Now these are the objectives for this topic. Firstly, we'll be looking at defining the Sugar Revolution. Then we'll take a look at the causes of the Sugar Revolution. Then we'll look at sugar in the Guyanas and the French islands. And finally, we'll take a look at the effects of the sugar revolution. So let's get into it. So let's look at defining the sugar revolution. Now in the 17th century, a revolutionary change began taking place among the English and French colonies. Now this change involved the revolutionary change of their basic and primary cash crop. Now this revolutionary change saw sugar replacing tobacco as the island's primary crop, which was a drastic change. But along with the change in the cash crop, there was also a drastic demographic change from primarily white Europeans to Africans. There was also changes in the size of land holdings. And there was also changes in the Caribbean developing into the primary driving force and focus for European development. All these changes were sparked by the change in the region's primary cash crop. And this is why collectively these changes are referred to as the sugar revolution. Now, if you were to use an official definition for the revolution, you can say the following. The sugar revolution is the term used to describe the change from the cultivation of tobacco to the cultivation of sugar and all other changes that followed such an action. Now, let's look at a backstory, or let's look at the backstory, which would lead us to the sugar revolution. Now, upon Europeans coming to the Caribbean, the crop that they initially focused on as being their primary cash crop was tobacco. They would have also produced cotton, cocoa, coffee, and indigo. Now, the Europeans had to focus on transporting these crops because one, they were in high demand in Europe. And two, they were not perishable nor bulky, which made transport easier. These two factors are the reasons why fruits and timber were not initially considered as profitable exports. Now, many of these crops, primarily coffee and cocoa, had to compete with tea produced in the East Indies. All of these crops were also grown to supply the need for European luxury markets. As a result, though there was much money to be made, competition was indeed heightened. Cotton and dyes, and dyes came from indigo and logwoods, were mainly sold to cloth producers, but even they were not as profitable. Then tobacco rose above the rest to become the most profitable cash crop grown in the Caribbean. And the reason why tobacco became so profitable is because of these following reasons. One, it was not as perishable once its leaves were cured. Two, a good quantity could be stored in small packages for transport. Three, it was easy to grow since the landowner and his family, along with a few other laborers, could cultivate it. So they need a whole army of persons to actually help you in, in taking care of them and cultivating them. Four, it did not need a large investment in machinery, buildings, or livestock. And five, smoking tobacco was seen as being fashionable among the European aristocracy. Now, let's look at some causes of this sugar revolution. Now, let's go back to the year 1613 with a man by the name of John Rolfe. Now, this man named John Rolfe, he went to Trinidad and acquired some West Indian tobacco from Trinidad and carried that West Indian tobacco to the American colony of Virginia. Now, Virginia was at the time the first in a series of American colonies that were being established. Now, the West Indian tobacco, here's the thing, it proved to grow quite well in Virginia. 
So much so that by the year 1627, just 14 years after the tobacco's introduction, Virginia was able to ship over 500,000 pounds of tobacco to England in one year. In contrast, in the following year in 1628, St. Kitts and Barbados collectively were only able to ship 100,000 pounds in total to England. Now, Virginia had more land space, so it therefore allowed plots in excess of 50 acres compared to the limit of 10 acres in the West Indies. Virginia was therefore able to meet England's ever-growing tobacco demand. Now, the West Indies were unable to compete as reaching the levels of output that Virginia produced proved to be too much for the region. And additionally, here's the thing, the quality. The quality of the West Indian tobacco actually proved to be poorer. So even though the tobacco was sourced from the West Indies, the conditions in Virginia were actually more ideal for its growth and development than the West Indies themselves. Wow. Additionally, the Dutch began trading tobacco at Araya in Venezuela and at Curacao. This additional competition resulted in the decrease in price of the West Indian tobacco, with many farmers ending production altogether. Now, the region therefore needed a new cash crop. Something had to be done. And that is where sugarcane entered the scene. And as we would say in our superhero movies, save the day. The origin of sugarcane. Now, sugarcane is said to be one of the first crops ever domesticated by human beings, and it was cultivated for over 10,000 years. Now, it is a grass-based plant, so it's very simple in its nature, and it originally grew wild in the forests of New Guinea in the East Indies, and you can see on the map there where New Guinea is or where modern-day Papua New Guinea is. Now, the residents of New Guinea were the first to cultivate the plant, growing it along mountain sides for local consumption to extract the juice that was in the pit of the stem of the plant, or was in the center of the stem of the plant. And the plant was then carried to India at around 8,000 BC. And it was here that the technique of creating sweetening crystals from the juice was developed. These crystals were known as sarkara, which is a Hindi word for sugar. <laughs> All right. Now, Persian merchants and traders then brought the cane, the sugar cane, from India into the Mediterranean region. So, therefore, now when they brought it into the Mediterranean region, those societies living in the Mediterranean as well as Northern Africa, which includes the Middle East, Northern Africa, Turkey, or what was known as Asia Minor, they now had access to this thing called sugarcane and therefore sugar. Arab traders then introduced the plant officially to Europe. Now, Europeans, such as the Italians and the Portuguese, began planting the crops, first growing in Sicily. As a matter of fact, Sicily is the very first place or very first confirmed place in Europe where sugarcane grew. It was then carried to the island of Crete and then to Madeira Island by Henry, the navigator. The plant was then introduced into the Western Hemisphere, first growing in Brazil. It was then introduced into the Caribbean by the Dutch, specifically being first grown in Barbados. Now, what helped sugar to thrive over the tobacco industry was the growing demand for sugar in Europe. You see, for centuries, Europeans used things like honey, and they would have even used things like dates. Well, Dates and honey would have been used not just by the Europeans. They would have been used by many societies, especially Mediterranean societies use dates. But societies all around the world use honey as sweetener. So it wasn't anything different with the Europeans. However, a commodity like honey had become very expensive and difficult to acquire. And you see, 
with honey becoming difficult to acquire, there was also a coinciding demand for tea and coffee. And the demand for tea and coffee was growing exponentially. You know, think about you drinking tea or coffee. One of the things you would want to do is you would want to put sweeteners in these drinks, but they found that it was very difficult and very expensive acquiring things and, and sweeteners like honey. Now, the sugarcane plants thrived in the tropical climate of the West Indies. Also, it was easier for the Europeans to access sugar from the West Indies as it was a closer and less expensive trip than, let me say, sailing all the way to the east, which was more expensive and risky. And then finally, above all other factors, the greatest or what is arguably the greatest contributor to the introduction, processing and success of sugar in the Caribbean is the actions of the great traders themselves, the Dutch. <laughs> all right. Now, between the years 1624 and 1654, the Dutch and the Portuguese were fighting for the large expanse of territory on the South American continent known as Brazil. Now, when the Dutch were becoming victorious, remember we actually mentioned this in an earlier episode, when the Dutch were becoming victorious, they began shipping Portuguese prisoners of war as slaves to be sold in the Caribbean islands. Now, in the year 1643, a Dutch ship brought 50 Portuguese soldiers to be sold as slaves in Barbados. The soldiers were freed as the English desired not to make any European identified as a Christian a slave. After Portugal began taking back the northeastern region of Brazil from the Dutch, many of the Dutch came to the islands to seek refuge. They also came, not just to seek refuge, but they also came with their expertise in sugarcane cultivation and sugar production. Now, the Dutch at this time were the main traders in the region. Remember, at one point in time, the Dutch had over 800 ships trading in the Caribbean region, which was really crazy. Therefore, they were able to introduce such commodities to the islands. The Dutch were also able to supply credit to farmers who did not have the capital to commence sugarcane cultivation. Very smart. The capital, and here's the real, real smart part. The capital would be put up on the security of the crop, and in return for supplying the capital, the Dutch would take over the export and sale <laughs> of the crop. Wow. The Dutch provided both specialized labor from their own expertise and manual labor, with the latter, meaning the manual labor, being in the form of slaves being brought to the Caribbean from West Africa. Now, you have to remember, at this time, the Dutch controlled the main slave ports in West Africa. Now, this importation of African slaves, which was initially done at about 3,000 slaves per year, led to demographic changes in the region with the white population dwindling and the islands, as was popularly said, becoming black. So a summary of the causes of the sugar revolution. The Caribbean was competing with tobacco that was grown from Virginia. Virginia was able to ship over five times more tobacco in one year than the Caribbean islands of St. Kitts and Barbados. Also, the quality of West Indian tobacco was seen as inferior compared to tobacco produced by Virginia and the tobacco traded by the Dutch in Venezuela. There was also the expansion of output for West Indian tobacco, which was not rapid at all. There was also the ever-growing demand for sugar in Europe, and it was increasing in along with, sorry, along with the increase in demand for commodities like tea and coffee. Sugarcane also grew easily in the tropical climate of the West Indies. And also there's the factor of the Dutch, because after being expelled from Brazil, when the Portuguese recaptured Northern Brazil, the Dutch who were experts at growing sugarcane in Brazil, settled down in Barbados and taught the locals how to cultivate the crop. Wow. 
Now let's look at sugar in the Guyanas and the French islands. Now sugar in the Guyanas and the French islands started since the 1630s when sugar cane was first grown at the mouth of the Essequibo River by the Dutch. The sugar revolution then reached here and the other Dutch colonies by the year 1656. And in this year, settlers were allowed to occupy the coastal regions. Now, colonies were then developed on the Pumeroon and Maruka rivers, which were collectively known as, or that area rather, was collectively known as Nova Zealandia. These settlements soon began producing more sugar than all the other settlements in the Guyanas. Then in the year 1667, the Dutch captured the area that we know today as Suriname and retained the territory officially through the terms of the Treaty of Breda signed in that same year, and we looked at this in a previous episode. The Dutch then used their expertise in sugar production to create sugar plantations that surpass the production of sugar from Nova Zealandia. It was also comparable and even surpassed in some cases to, um, the production from the English colonies, which was a very big deal. <laughs> All right. There was also sugar production in the French islands. Now, the sugar revolution took place over a longer period of time in Martinique and Guadeloupe than in the English islands. It officially began in the year 1670 and became completed over a century later. It took place over a longer period of time because, one, the largest sizes of the two islands, and two, the continuation of the growing of large amounts of tobacco, which is very interesting. The large size of the islands meant that not only was more land available, but that the lands were also cheaper, especially for even the poor whites to purchase. And we'll be mentioning these poor whites in a short while. So keep staying tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> now, as opposed to what happened in the English islands, white smallholders stayed on these islands even after the Sugar Revolution. In Martinique, by the year 1750, there were 12,000 whites and 71,000 black slaves. In the same year, Guadeloupe had 14,000 whites and 84,000 black slaves. Both islands, and this was in comparison to the English, both islands saw an increase in their white population. And this, as we're about to see, was not the case with the English, all right, which was very unique and commendable in terms of how the French would have managed this whole revolution. They, they actually, if, if we share in our opinions on it, it seems by evidence that they quite possibly managed it better than the English did. All right. Now, Saint-Domingue, which is modern day Haiti, was seen as a sugar colony from its inception. It was formally recognized as belonging to France in the year 1697, and by 1701, lands were cleared to establish plantations, with as many as 35 sugar mills becoming operational. By the year 1750, Saint-Domingue had a population of 32,000 whites and 250,000 black slaves. Wow. Now let's look at the effects of the sugar revolution. Now, in this lesson, we wanna take a look at five major effects. We're gonna look at five major effects of the sugar revolution, five monumental effects. And the first effect that we're gonna look at is land use changes. Now, tobacco was grown on small holdings of between five and 30 acres. It also did not require much manpower to take care of it. Usually, an entire plantation might be worked by a white indentured servant, by the owner with a white indentured servant, or with a black slave. So you might have the white owner with the white indentured servant and the black slave working together to take um, care of the tobacco small holdings of the tobacco um, crops and the, and the parcel of land that they have. 
Now in Barbados, for example, by the year 1645, there were about 5,000 small holdings covering half of the island's total square footage with about 5,000 active African slaves. After 1645, as the price of tobacco decreased, it was seen that land sizes had to increase. However, the competitive advantage of the Virginia colony meant that looking for a new cash crop was the best option. Therefore, land sizes of 5 to 30 acres were no longer feasible to make any profit. And even with the possibilities of sugar cane, smallholders did not have enough capital to buy land. <laughs> also, and this was a major problem, especially with Barbados, the increase in population on the island made it more difficult to feed persons. So persons therefore tried to move to other islands in search of better opportunities. They chose to become buccaneers. Um, they chose to travel back to England, or they even chose to join the British Army, which was at the time Oliver Cromwell's army during the Interregnum. As a result of this, land became available for the larger sugar estates or the larger sugar plantations on Barbados as well as other islands. Now, sugar cane could only be grown economically on large estates. Because, you see, land holdings, they had to be joined together to form large estates that would be owned by either a rich planter, um, they would be owned by a partnership of two planters, or a planter who had a good credit rating which would have allowed the Dutch to supply him with machinery and slaves. Now, most sugar plantations in Barbados were about 150 acres, with some being as much as 500 acres. Now, even with much space, sugar plantations had to ensure to be self-sustaining. So therefore, and here's the issue with this, it sounds good, but it means that a lot of other space on the plantations that could have been used for sugar production have to be used for other purposes. So space had to be made mostly for the sugarcane crop, which is about 50% of the land, followed by pasture for animals that provided meat and milk to graze, then arable land for growing crops like potatoes, corn, bananas, cassava, vegetables, and fruit. You also had to provide some land space for, for woodland developing, development for timber, and finally, the remaining land would be used for tobacco, cotton, and other crops. Now, other colonies had larger estates, such as Jamaica in the 17th century, who had an average estate size of about 300 acres and had estates being as large as 5,000 acres. However, Barbados had less unused land as its terrain was flatter than most other territories. So as a result, Barbados and Antigua, for example, had more plantations than other territories. So Jamaica would have had much more unused land, uh, much more forested, uncleared areas, which would have been better for the environment anyway, but more forested, uncleared areas than Barbados. Barbados and Antigua, um, over half of the islands were already tilled and occupied and created into plantations not many years after the, the inception of um, British impact there, all right? And you see the terrain of these islands were very flat. They still are very flat, which would have allowed the British to, to undergo development quite easily. So as a result now, Barbados and Antigua had many plantations, but the issue here is that there was frequent tillage of the soil. So in these islands, there came about an issue of soil exhaustion. All right, which would have impacted the growth of the plants. All right, so that would have been a major issue. Now, land holdings in the French islands in the 17th century remained small. 
These islands also continued cultivating tobacco on a large scale for export. However, by the 18th century, they had completed a changeover to large sugar estates. Now, although the number of land holdings in these islands were less than in the English islands, the average size of a plantation was larger, exceeding 5,000 acres, especially in Saint-Domingue. The lands were also not excessively planted with sugarcane, which helped to prevent the occurrence of soil exhaustion. I told you the French, it, it just seems like the French just, they, they were just managing this revolution better than the British were. Now, the sugar revolution caused land prices in the islands to increase tremendously. In Barbados, for example, in the year 1630, 10 acres of land would have been sold at 25 pounds, which would have been about three pounds per acre. However, by the year 1648, the price went up to 30 pounds per acre. If someone were to purchase the smallest advised lot size for a sugar plantation in Barbados, which was about 150 acres, it would have cost them about 4,000 pounds. Now, in our modern money today, that's about 158,000 pounds. Now, if someone were to also purchase a 500-acre plot of land, they would have to pay as much as 14,000 pounds, which would be about 554,000 pounds in today's money, taking factoring in inflation. Now, some planters to afford the lands therefore had to possess half shares, thereby paying half of the required funds. This is why many large estates had two planters as owners, Many persons would have tried to do it this way. So having a 500-acre estate or more proved more profitable than the smaller estate sizes. So as a result, a lot of these farmers would have tried to uh, link up with another farmer and say, okay, I'll pay half, you'll pay half, and we'll be co-owners, that kind of thing. Because with more land space, it means you could grow more crops, have more space for grazing for more animals, more space for growing timber, more space for growing food for self-sufficiency, and so on and so forth. All right, so that is the first effect of the sugar revolution, land use changes. The second effect that we'll look at is population changes. Now, the sugar revolution brought about a change in the size and composition of the population of each island. The white section of the population in each island declined as the black population increased due to the importation of African persons as slaves. Now, the initial plan of the English was to allow the white to black ratio in each island to be about one to 10, meaning for every one white person, there would be 10 black persons. However, with increasing labor needs after the revolution, maintaining this ratio was difficult because after a while they're saying, you know what, we have a lot of crops to grow. We have a lot of cultivation and processing to undergo. We can't really study this ratio thing. We need a labor. So they started bringing in slaves by the droves, especially in Saint-Domingue. And we'll look at that in the future episode. Now, many white smallholders lost their land during the revolution and they refused to become wage laborers. This added to the need for more African laborers. This resulted in a small white elite emerging in the midst of a large number of black slaves in each of the colonies. So let's look at some examples of the population changes seen in some of the islands. And we're going to look at four English colonies here. So first of all, in Barbados in the, year six, in the 1640s, sorry, there would have been about 18,000 whites, 5,500 blacks for a total population of about 23,500. By the 1740s, there were 15,000 whites, so the white population decreased, 68,000 blacks for a total population of 83,000 persons. So as you can see, the white population decreased, but the black population increased exponentially. What about Jamaica? 
In the 1650s, the white population was 4,500 and the black population was 1,500 <laughs> for a total of 6,000 persons. By the 1740s, less than 100 years later, the white population was 10,000. It grew, but look at the black population. It grew exponentially to 112,000 persons for a total population of 122,000 persons. St. Kitts, the mother colony of the English colonies herself. In the 1660s, the white population would have been 7,000 persons, the black population 3,000 for a total population of 10,000 persons. However, by the 1740s, less than 100 years, the white population decreased to 3,000, but the black population increased to 19,000 for a total population of 22,000 persons. And finally, let's look at Antigua. In the 1660s, the white population in Antigua was 1,000. The black population was 500 for a total population of 1,500 persons. But by the 1740s, the white population grew, just like Jamaica, it grew to 3,500. But the black population grew from 500 to 28,000 people for a total population of 31,500. People, So you see how aggressive the importation of black slaves from West Africa was in these islands, especially in the English colonies. All right. So that is our look at the effect of sugar revolution in relation to popular population changes. All right. Now let's take a, let, let's take a look at a third effect, which is monoculture. Now, the sugar revolution brought about an occurrence of monoculture. Now, monoculture refers to the cultivation of a single crop. This was seen primarily in the English islands and would have caused some problems in their economies. Now, the old colonial system had provided the English islands with a guaranteed market, which was England. As a result of free trade not occurring during the 17th and 18th centuries, and as a result of the high profits obtained from sugar production, English planters focused on producing the developing cane production and nothing else. <laughs> All right. This resulted in other crops being neglected. Now, Barbados especially felt the effects of monoculture, and we actually mentioned this before. You see, the island produced as much as 15,000 tons of sugar per year from over 300 plantations. However, because other crops were neglected, which was not wisdom at all, other crops were neglected, there was a starvation issue. So many workers were dying due to being undernourished or just starving to death, general starvation. Barbados then had to depend on imported food such as dried fish, wheat, and meat from the North American colonies. Such a dependency was difficult as it was contingent on whether England was in command of the sea during the peacetime or whether there was some European conflict, some warfare occurring. And here's the thing, it wasn't just a case in, the, in Barbados. The Leeward Islands also had a major monoculture issue. Now, Jamaica among the English colonies was the exception in that even though its economy was based on sugar primarily, it was able to be self-sustaining much more than the other English colonies. The French territories were also self-sustaining to an even greater extent because they adopted policies of depending on indigenously growing foods and they never let sugar become too dominant of a crop to the point where they can't be self-sustaining. So that's monoculture. We have two other effects we want to look at. Our fourth effect is social stratification. Now, after the sugar revolution, society changed from being over 90% free to being over 90% enslaved. Wow. It became a popular thing to use the word white as a synonym for free and black 
as a synonym for enslaved. That is sad. Wow. Now, the social organization of the Caribbean slave society was a little something like this. If you were white, you were either born in Europe or in the Caribbean to European parents. You had political power, control of most of the land, and had access to many resources, such as transport, infrastructure, livestock, and machinery. You would not share power with the non-white persons in the population, and you absolutely live in fear of slave uprisings. Then there were the colored people. You were a mixture of European and African heritage, and you were born in the Caribbean. However, by law, you were separated from the whites. You had no political power, you were in control of limited land space, and you found yourself constantly struggling to achieve equality with the whites. And then there were the Blacks. If you were Black, you were born in Africa or in the Caribbean to African parents. You were separated from the whites and the colored by law with no political power and no legal rights. You found yourself constantly resisting your living conditions. Now, social divisions among slaves were largely based on their occupation. They would have either been domestic slaves, artisan slaves, or field slaves. All social divisions were based on this and nothing else. It couldn't be based on economics, it couldn't be based on education, and it couldn't be based on family lineage because one, slaves were not allowed to own their property, so it couldn't be based on economics. Two, slaves were not allowed to attain any formal education, so it could not be based on education. And three, slave owners sought to destroy family ties and any tribal identity to prevent uprising, so it could not be um, family lineage. This is really sad. Now, there was no social mobility between black and white. Even when a black person became free, they were seen as inferior to the white person, only because of their skin color. You know, I, even as we go through this, you, you, it, it makes you think that, we, yes, we're doing history, but it sometimes sounds like we're doing current affairs. <laughs> we're like, wow, eh? wow, this is sad. Now, even poor, poverty-stricken, illiterate whites were seen as better than black slaves. So resultantly, many poor whites did their best to identify themselves with rich planters and the generally influential white circles. Now, the whites and the blacks were united with their own kind through common bonds. For the whites, the common bond was the bond of skin color. And for the blacks, the common bond was the bond of slavery. Now, the sugar revolution therefore widened the great divide between white and black, creating a separation in West Indian society, which resulted in immense racial prejudice. And finally, we'll take a look at the last effect of, or the last major effect of the sugar revolution, which was absenteeism. Now, as a result of the success of the profits gained from sugar production, Many planters returned to England and profited off of their estates in the Caribbean. This was mainly seen in the English colonies, with many stating that there were both factors pushing the planters away from the region and factors pulling him back to England. And because he was absent, this is the origin of the term in this context, um, the term that is used, which is absenteeism. All right. Now, there were four main push factors or four main factors that uh, were deemed as pushing the planter back to England. So one, the West Indian climate was seen as unhealthy due to the occurrence of diseases such as malaria and yellow fever. Now, remember at this time, they didn't know that malaria and yellow fever was caused by mosquitoes. Instead, they just thought it was something that just naturally occurred like that. So they saw the climate as being unhealthy, <laughs> all right? Two, 
Living close to slaves presented the planters with many moral difficulties. And when you think about this, it could, it, it could encapsulate so many things. Um, moral difficulties in, in terms of how they treated the slaves, moral difficulties in terms of like things like sexual abuse and so on of female slaves and, and even male slaves. It, it, it was just a whole plethora of issues. Three, there was pronounced lack of any cultural life on the plantation. I mean, they want to enjoy themselves. They probably want to go out, have a drink or so with friends. But even when you're on the plantation making money, it's difficult to do that. Sometimes it might just be you alone. And four, there was no educational facilities for the planters' children. Now, along with the opposites of each of these push factors, <laughs> some other pull factors would include the ease of social mobility for a wealthy man, thereby achieving status in English society. He wanted that. All right. So that, that's how England probably would have pulled him, inadvertently pulled him. And two, the ability to make oneself wealthier by acting as a commission agent for those in the Caribbean or by becoming a merchant in a seaport to handle Caribbean trade. Now, there was one interesting argument for absenteeism. Now, absenteeism seemingly increased the strength of the sugar lobby in England with absentee planters controlling many seats in the House of Commons, even as much as 50 seats in the House of Commons by the 18th century. Now, through this lobby, they pressed the government for naval protection of the island and the West Indian trade, as well as for the maintenance of high sugar prices. However, the arguments against absenteeism kind of overshadow the argument for. You see, absenteeism led to mismanagement of the sugar estates and the eventual decline of the estate's value. The owner's affairs were left in the hands of an agent who was called an attorney, and we mentioned this in a previous episode. Now, usually because of the absenteeism, the mismanagement led to great abuse corruption, and a decline in the value of the estate itself. Absenteeism also led to the eventual destruction of the plantation system, while draining the islands of the wealth which could have been used for agricultural, economic, and social development. And then absenteeism also increased the imbalance between the black and white sections of the population, bringing further social instability. This therefore increased the chances of slave rebellions. So in conclusion, the sugar revolution referred to all the changes or effects that occurred as a result of the cultivation of sugarcane as the West Indies' main cash crop. Sugar was the perfect alternative over tobacco for many reasons. There was immense competition from Virginia in terms of the quantity and quality of tobacco production. There was expansion of output and quality of tobacco for the West Indies, which was poor. The demand for sugar began increasing in Europe. The tropical climate helped the sugarcane plant to grow well in the West Indies. And the impact of the Dutch traders and exports in growing and processing sugarcane, as well as trading the sugar, was truly felt. And then we looked at the five principal effects of the sugar revolution, which were effects of land use changes, population changes, monoculture issues, stratification or social stratification, and five absenteeism of planters. And this is where we come to an end of our look at the sugar revolution. And in our next episode, we'll take a look at a very monumental aspect of Caribbean history. We'll take a look at the African slave trade, part one. But this has been another episode of Island Uplift's history class, and I hope to see you in the next one. But for now, class dismissed. Mm -hmm.